Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the FinTech Blueprint. It's your podcast about FinTech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Welcome everybody to the podcast today. I'm really excited for our conversation with Curtis. Curtis is the co-founder and CEO at Pinwheel, and we're going to learn about this awesome company and the fintech themes that it's embedding into really interesting footprints. And it's also quite a unique play, so I'm excited to talk about it. Curtis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Lex. Really excited for this conversation and big fan of your work. So I'm, I'm really happy we finally get a chance to meet and to uh, talk fintech. So we like to open the conversation with understanding your motivations and understanding how you've put together your career and kind of what led you to this definitional experience that you're having with Pinwheel. So let's start earlier on. What did you focus on? What did you study? And then how did you enter the workforce? Like what was your initial entry into it? Great question. So I was thinking about this the other day, actually. I feel like I've always just naturally been a, a builder. I think the the most joy I get is kind of in that really hazy, abstract, zero to one phase of things. So I actually started my first company while I was at UCLA. As a sophomore, my friends and I saw that bike theft on campus was a really big deal. And it was like happening to all of our the folks within our network. And so we wondered if we could solve the problem by trying to build a piece of hardware that would attach to your bike to kind of prevent bike theft. So imagine like a low jack for bikes. My two co-founders are except, were exceptionally smarter than I was. And so they built an incredible piece of hardware. And then me being the business guy, you know, tried to put it all together. The long and short of that journey was that, you know, as a barely 20 year old trying to figure out how supply chain and everything else works was a tall order, but we did get it off the ground and eventually actually passed it off to much more professional operators to get it, that <laughs> going. And so we, that, that company is, is actually doing quite well, not related anything to do with myself or my contribution. So I'm just, I'm just glad I got out. Of, I was smart enough to get out of the way um, and let real people do their work. You shouldn't have to learn the word supply chain until you reach your forties. Like that's, <laughs> I think that should be the rule for business, but that initial scar tissue is super important. You're not going to get around figuring out how to build from scratch without actually trying to build from scratch. What did you do after? From there, I think it basically made me realize that you could really actually, you know, like this is a thing, right? Like I think back then growing up, the idea of entrepreneurship really wasn't a focal point for anyone in my circles, right? Like I was raised in a traditional Asian family where it was like, hey, like you're either supposed to be a lawyer or a doctor or maybe an engineer. And so I didn't really realize that that was a thing until, you know, I got to, to college and tried this thing, uh, tried building a company on my own. And from then I was hooked. So I, I joined another startup in the Valley, which was like a mix between a product design agency that was between both like industrial and graphic design it was a really interesting thesis where there was kind of this like confluence of both that service, the market that had never really existed before and helped grow that business to an eventual acquisition by Capgemini, the consulting firm. And then after that, I actually joined my current co-founder, Curtis, at his startup. And that is actually kind of the true genesis of the pinwheel story. So Basically, the, the winding journey with Lux was a really interesting one. We worked with incredible people. And we eventually were acquired by Volvo, the car manufacturer, in fall of 2017. And it was there that Curtis and I had received health savings accounts, HSAs, for the first time in our lives. And we noticed something really interesting about them, which was that the kind of the, the utilization model for these accounts is pretty fundamentally broken. Because you have to pre-fund to use these accounts. And for the majority of Americans who live paycheck to paycheck, they don't actually have the cash flow to pre-fund these accounts. And so they're effectively barred from what would be like a federal discount on medical costs. So we said, I wonder if we can solve this problem by inverting the utilization and basically saying, have someone connect their accounts with Plaid or some sort of other aggregator. And then we built an algorithm to comb through people's transactions 
and detect whenever they made a qualified medical expense. Then we'd go in their payroll system and make the exact contribution on a one month delay so that you basically never had to do any work and you got your tax savings added automatically to your paycheck every month. So like an automated HSA, if you will. We're already in the secret sauce. Let's roll back for some definitions. You're in this role at Lux, which then becomes part of Volvo, right? And this is sort of like a, a real operating role where you're dealing with lots of people and very multifunctional. And you've noticed these HSA accounts as part of the infrastructure the company has for employee benefits, right? What exactly is an HSA account? Yeah, good question. So a health savings account, an HSA, is a tax advantaged account that allows an employee to set aside money from their paycheck specifically for medical expenses. And in doing so, they do not have to pay taxes on those funds. And thus you get, you know, anywhere between a 20 to, you know, 35, 40% discount on those expenses. What we realized is, you know, that's the way that these traditional accounts have always worked. But because you have to proactively set aside funds to do so, for a lot of the folks who, you know, need to spend their full paycheck, they just simply don't have the luxury of saying, yeah, I, I'll take, you know, 5, 10, 20% of my paycheck and set it aside into this account because they just, they, they need every dollar and every penny, right? And this is a structural advantage, right? Having these accounts because of the tax savings, they come out, they're taken out of the top line. But as an employee, they're really quite clunky to use because they're kind of trapped in this employer benefit world. And so you mentioned trying to extract that data and do something with it. Can you give a little bit more context maybe of like what you were doing at Volvo and kind of like how this idea grew while you were there? The thesis that we had around this is for exactly what you mentioned, there's a real friction in using these things because you have to kind of make this decision around, well, am I or am I not, or do I even have the luxury to put aside money to actually then spend on these you know, medical costs that I may or may not have? And so there's all this ambiguity in the using of these accounts that we were like, okay, like it's clunky. It requires you to be like really good at guessing if you're going to get sick or if you're going to get hurt in the future. And it just doesn't make any sense. So what if we actually say, you don't need to have to try to prognosticate and like guess into the future. Let's just have you connect your regular spending accounts. And then God forbid, if something does happen when you do incur medical costs, like we built this categorization engine to look at transactions, label things as either medical or non-medical. And if they were medical and qualified, we would flag it to you as the consumer and say, hey, by the way, we noticed this month that you spent you know, X dollars either going to, to, to a doctor or getting some sort of medically qualified procedure. We can go on your behalf and make the right contribution so that you basically get the tax savings added automatically to your paycheck without having to pre-fund. And that way, you're not really ever kind of like taking the hit on the float, right? You're only ever contributing exactly what you have already spent. And that kind of like inverted utilization, as we, as I mentioned, reduces the need for you to have to guess about how much you should put away and guess about, you know, what it is that you may have to spend on. And I think that was, it created a really magical experience for users because it was just like, you never had to worry about any of that anymore. You would just connect your accounts. And then if you so happen to spend anything on medical costs, you could basically automatically get the tax savings back into your pocket. I would guess that most people have no idea how to even log into their employee benefit portals. Like they don't even know what the username passwords are or what their benefits are. How do you get people to engage? How do you pull them into this problem? Or is there a segmentation of users that have ongoing medical costs, so it's very top of mind? How do you reach towards the consumer here? Yeah, so I, I would connect this idea to the origin story of the company, and then I can, I'm can. i happy to dive into this piece because I think it's actually all very related. So we brought this automated HSA product to market and have a pro had a problem that I feel like every startup witches they had, which is there was so much demand we were unable to keep up with them. And basically, 
every customer would come in and say, hey, this is really cool. We want to use it, but we use ADP, we use Workday, we use Paychecks. Do you support these platforms? And we'd be like, well, no. <laughs> it's just like a really, you know, janky duct taped beta with Gusto and JustWorks. And we don't support any of these like large platforms. And so we were spending all of our engineering hours not actually building product, which is never a good sign this early on in the business, but building integrations into payroll providers just to just to make sure that we could actually meet demand. And we were like, there's got to be something out there, some sort of API or infrastructure product that just, just will allow us to do this versus having to do it ourselves. And we just searched high and low and couldn't find anything. And so at that point, we just basically built a platform internally for ourselves just to power our own app. and. We had this aha moment as we started talking to other fintech players in our community and kind of more broadly in the market. And every time we talked about the problem that we had with this and what we were building, the first questions that we always got were like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Like, what kind of data are you guys pulling out of these systems? What else can you do? Is it both read and write? And we, you know, it's read and write because we need to, you know, update the settings in their system and we're pulling everything around who someone is, how much they make, where they work, like a pretty robust set of information because we needed all those to really understand what was going on with each consumer and employee. And everyone was like, well, are you open to white labeling this thing? Because we want to, we want to use this too. We want to try this out. And it was at that moment that we were like, wow, there's actually something really big here. There aren't just tens or hundreds. There's thousands of other companies out there, not just in the fintech ecosystem, but more broadly in consumer finance that need this information in order to actually build the products they want to build. And once we realized that, we decided to pivot away from the app, sunset that, and then really focus on the infrastructure layer instead to support and enable folks like us to actually build the future of the financial system. And so the impetus and an origin story of how we got to where we are today. And to answer your question around the getting the, the actual data itself, you're absolutely right. To a certain extent, folks like you and I, we generally don't log into these systems very often unless it's to update something in our you know benefits or maybe like your tax allocations, what have you, right? But broadly, you're getting the same paycheck every two weeks. So you're really not you know, looking at that thing very often. Now, there are a lot of other segments of society who check their platforms very regularly because they are hourly and they need to be logging time and attendance information on a daily basis. They are you know, living much more on the margin. So every day, dollar counts, right? And so they are constantly tracking to see, are they going to be able to make rent on time? Are they going to be able to, you know, be able to play for a a flat tire that came out of nowhere uh, or an unexpected medical cost? And so there's actually a surprisingly high number of people who do know their logins and passwords and are actually actively checking these systems on a regular basis. And that was kind of the, the key insight that made us really confident that building this platform that would unlock all this data in these walled gardens of payroll systems. And actually more broadly, I would say just like the income sources across the board. I think it's important to note that it's not just payroll systems, right? It's like gig platforms like Uber and Lyft. It's federal portals. Like we cover every single federal employee in the country, as well as many state government employees as well. Also what we would call future of work platforms too, right? So like an Etsy or eBay, et cetera. So all of those quote unquote, income sources that we support. The thesis was if we could unlock them, connect those pipes to the banks, the lenders, the fintechs that need that information, and then put the power of unlocking that access in the hands of consumers, it was a a win-win-win, right? Where the consumers can actually finally access better financial products for themselves. Like actually, we, we can help people unlock lower interest rates by sharing more data or access to the direct deposit. We're helping the fintechs and the banks and lenders in the ecosystem build better products and actually improve outcomes for the business as well, like lower risk, um, increase volumes, what have you, by just being able to service more customers because they have more data. And we're also able to help the payroll providers actually you know, build even further lock-in with their customers because this data is actually helping employee retention, employee engagement, et cetera. So it was a really exciting thing to see that everything was kind of self-fulfilling in that way. 
that's a great transition to Pinwheel. And again, I think it's quite a unique business that you've built with unique positioning. I want to ask two questions. We'll probably return to some of the things that you've said, but open them up a little bit more. And so the first question is going to be about who is Pinwheel's customer? And in particular, you talked about, you know, there's a lot of demand. And so it'd be great to really understand, and I think this is true for a lot of embedded finance, because you know people in financial services and fintech don't have these intuitions about what the, what the world is really like. It's really important to understand the shape of the demand that you see. So I'd love to start with that. The second question is going to be kind of really double-clicking on, in a simple way, your connector, right? Like, what kind of information do you connect from where to where and sort of how that opens up these product opportunities? But first, I'd love to start with what's the demand? Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually love sharing this story because it actually shows a couple things. So when we came out of Stealth in June of 2020, we candidly had like very little PR strategy. We basically just begged our friends at TechCrunch for like, please, please write an article. Like, we need leads. <laughs> we need the market to know that we exist. And they were like, fine, we'll write it. Just please stop annoying us. And so when that article came out, we were like, if we can just get 15 or 20 leads, that'll be a really great outcome. And in the first 72 hours, we received 133 organic inbounds from big banks like Chase, BOA, Wells Fargo, City, basically every large consumer fintech, so like Square, PayPal, Credit Karma, Lending Club, like all these other folks, Chime, and also just a, a massive number of like mid-market early stage startups as well. And so we were like, oh my God, there's something really, really big here. And I think the way that we had been thinking about it initially was the way that I think a lot of investors, when they first hear about this idea, think about it, which is, okay, well, this is, you know, a platform for income and employment verification, right? Like you're, a, and in fact, that's actually what our tech article said. It was like, oh, Pinwheel is, you know, the income verification platform that every fintech needs. And once we saw all this demand come in and start having conversations with everyone, we realized that was such a myopic way of thinking about it because the thesis is actually way larger than that. If you look at the roadmaps of the largest consumer finance and fintech companies for the next five to 10 years, the majority of the big bets that they are making product-wise fundamentally cannot exist without something in our platform. And once we realize that kind of like secret, we realize that what we're building is actually a platform, a, a, a building platform for all of these innovators to actually build off of, right? What it became clear to us then was there's probably 50 plus use cases and products that we could build right now. And at least five or six of those are billion dollar markets. And so for us, it became this question of where do we start, right? Like the number one advantage that a startup has is focus. As soon as you lose that, like you lose. And so like we couldn't just go out and build a hundred use cases. We needed to pick one to start and then expand from there. We did a bunch of homework around like what makes a great API platform. And one of the things that we learned was just the great API platforms do two things. Number one is they create net new markets. They don't actually go after existing TAMs. So you look at Twilio, right? They, they created the messaging market that didn't exist before them. And I think that's like a really telling example. And Plaid is, yeah, I think, another good example of that as well. And the second thing they do is that they grow alongside their customers, right? So in the case of Twilio, they grew alongside Uber and Lyft. That two-factor auth use case drove a lot of the revenue in the early days. Same thing with, with Plaid, right? The, the micro-deposit use case is what grew ben, from Venmo and other larger players. Like that's, that's what helped grow them in the early days. And so we said, okay, where is the like, highest urgency, sharpest pain point that we're hearing in these customer conversations? And it was so clear that it was all of these consumer fintechs who were in desperate need for direct deposits, right? Like it's, I think, du jour now that everyone has a debit card, right? Like literally, I, I can't name a single consumer fintech company and I'm curious if you can, that doesn't have a debit or, or, or a UDA like part of their business. And the reason for that is because the way that you're actually monetizing this market is the same way that you've needed to monetize for the past millennia, right? Which is, you know, bring your money in, consumer, and then 
as you start to spend with us because you're bringing your money in, we'll monetize, right? Either on interchange or in some other way. And now you're sticky, you're high engagement. Best of all, you, you, you become really high LTV. Like for one of the top three neo banks in the country, can't say which, their LTV between a direct deposit and non-direct deposit customers, 32x, massive, right? And so we said, okay, capturing a direct deposit is critical for a lot of these folks, but it's really hard to do it. You either have to submit a paper form to an HR team, or worse yet, you have to kind of self-serve on your own like ADP portal, and it's just a, a terrible UX and super high friction. So we said, okay, we have these connections with these payroll platforms. We can just condense all the friction down to a single click and then embed it at the point of highest intent. So, you know, one of our customers is Cash App, and they obviously have a, a great banking product. So a customer will sign up for an account, and then they'll be prompted to say, hey, if you correct your direct deposit, you'll unlock all these cool features. And at that point, Pinwheel would show up as a part of the experience. They would say, yes, I want to connect my ADP account. And once they do on the back end, we can update the direct deposits to make sure that they're now going to Cash App versus maybe going to their you know Bank of America account before. and we were able to see that just within the first month, we were increasing direct deposit penetration rates by 20% or sometimes even more. These are people with like large scale. We're not talking about like a, a startup that just has only a few thousand users. We're talking people who have millions and millions of MAU. And so we saw like if we can create 20% increase in direct, in direct deposit penetration rate for these large customers, this thing is, is real. Like This thing provides real value. And so that was the wedge product that we brought to market to really kind of plant our flag. So what I'm hearing is the shape of the customer is a B2C consumer fintech that is, you know, either a neobank or a digital investing app or a robo advisor but that wants to have a cash account. And of course, all these companies have the issue that they are cash account number 3 or 4. They're not important to people. Even though people like using them, they don't use them for their main savings. And so instead of having an average account size of you know, $3,000, the average account size is you know, $30 or something like that. And of course, that leads to terrible economics for B2C fintechs. And so what they were getting from you, as I understand it, is the ability to integrate into payroll systems such that they're able to switch people's default direct deposit, the default flow of money from... Wells Fargo Bank of America to Cash App. That's exactly right. The one thing I will add is we started with consumer fintechs. What we're seeing now is that the adoption of this type of technology is actually happening very quickly in the traditional FIs as well. I think they're, to their credit, are realizing now that like they need to stay really close to the market and make sure that they're not falling too far behind their, you know, more nimble competitors. And so, you know, some of the we're we're, you know, talking with all the big four banks and a lot of the the largest institutions in the country are like do doing RFPs as we speak. And so I think the adoption of this type of work is is uh, coming to the fore very quickly. What's the value proposition for, let's say, a big financial institution? Like, aren't they already integrated into the payroll providers? Maybe we can kind of double click and clarify. You had mentioned getting data from Plaid or from other aggregators, but it sounds like at this stage, you've done a ton of work to create integrations into places where usually data aggregators don't go, right? So, if I'm hearing that correctly, it's the ADPs and the payroll providers of the world. Is that right? Can you open that up a little bit for me? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll answer the first question first, and then I'll go into the second one. So the reason why all of these big banks and also consumer fintechs care so much about the direct deposit piece is because if you look at, I'm going to get a little more jargony here, when you map out a consumer's flow of funds, right? almost every dollar in their wallet can be traced back to their paycheck. So if you were to diagram out a consumer financial stack, the payroll system is actually at the very top of that stack. It's actually higher up and even precedes your own bank account. It's actually what brings the money to your bank account. So if you can build the pipes to control that flow of funds from the source, aka the payroll system, it's an incredibly important position to be because you basically get first rights on where that money ends up. And so that was the thesis behind why we thought it was so important to build the direct deposit switching product first and to build those pipes 
to make that process really seamless. Now, when it comes to the actual business impact for whether it's a, a consumer fintech or these you know, large retail banks, the direct deposit is effectively the place where people's paychecks land, right? It's their income source. And if you can get the income source for a consumer, you created a really powerful lock-in with that consumer, right? Because as mentioned earlier, if you have your money coming in, well, you still got to spend money. You got to pay rent, you got to pay for food, you got to pay for whatever other cost that you have. So if you have the money there, then you're going to be spending the money there. And if you're spending the money there, then that's the best way, especially for fintechs to monetize on the consumer's you know engagement with your company right and so you can get that interchange revenue and then you can also start to build more of an actual relationship with that consumer over time and so it's it's a really powerful wedge and kind of on ramp for that consumer to actually work with you as a financial service provider now the next step in that thesis is once you are building that relationship and they're you know continuing to bring more and more of their paycheck to you, you you really you want to become the primary banking relationship and once you have become that then it becomes really easy to say hey well you already have your money with us right why don't i offer you a suite of other financial service products that i know you need right like why don't you get a mortgage from us why don't you get a credit card from us why don't you get all these other things and that's that's the way that banking has worked for again for like centuries now right I think the interesting thing that we have seen is that same thesis is true, but there's a lot of really clever things that these fintechs are doing that are not just like, oh, let me upsell you into a mortgage, right? It's this thesis of, well, now that you're in here and you're, you know, we're building this relationship with you, how do I continue to add really high value to your financial life in a way that is actually, you know, something that you're excited about? And so, you know, there's two products that we are rolling out, or rather, I should say, have rolled out and are continuing to roll out with our customers that really fit this thesis. One is around earned wage access, right? And this will kind of actually lead into us the answer to your second question, which is when you think about what it takes to build earned wage access effectively, you need a lot of data, right? Because prior to our existence, it's only ever been done in two ways. One is I'm going to go to the employer and be like, hey, Walmart, give me your employees' information and I will be able to offer them liquidity day in, day out because I can see that they've you know clocked in and clocked out of their shift today. And then the, the carrot for Walmart to do this is hypothetically, I could increase employee engagement, increase employee retention, and there's like a, a some type of bottom line impact there. But it's really hazy and the attribution is really hard to do, right? And worse yet, it's impossible to reach scale because you're selling HR team to HR team and it just takes you forever, right? The other model for earn wage access that has existed is D2C, right? So you have companies like Earnin who do this through a, a mix of ways like they're trying to, you know, geolocate and get other information then kind of piece together this idea of, okay, is this person someone that we can forward money to knowing that they've, you know, actually worked their shift and they're, they're good for the money, right? We realize in, like both of those solutions are incomplete. Right. And we realized, wait a second, you can actually build a true earn wage access solution if you have all the data. And that's exactly what we do. So we connect not only with all these payroll providers, but we also connect with time and attendance systems directly. So we can say with 100% certainty, you know, Lex has clocked in and clocked out and worked eight hours today at a shift at Chipotle. We also know that as of this very moment that Lex is asking for a paycheck advance, he is still employed. So he's still good for the money. And then when he actually does get paid in two weeks or, you know, some systems still only pay you monthly, a month later, we have access to direct deposit. So we can also guarantee repayment by being first money out on that paycheck. So if you put those three things together, now you have earn wage access as a feature. And we're bringing that to market with some of the largest players in the fintech space. But whether it's the big guys or whether it's, you know, a fintech that's just starting tomorrow, they can deploy true earn wage access as a feature in their app. You know, that's that's I think the, the the power of the pinwheel platform is to say, you know, we have all these pieces bundled together, use the API and you can deploy all of these really powerful features that help you engage and monetize your your users and your customers. You mentioned this idea of being the first money out. You mentioned this idea about, you know, connectivity directly to systems like ADP, which kind of predate the money flow and the ability to 
you know, potentially hold some of it back or chunk it back on the next paycheck. So is the sort of suite of services that you're talking about the one in between somebody getting, you know, like earning their wage and the time it takes for the banking system to like cut and process a check? The reason I'm asking is because there's folks that try to underwrite, you know, that period of time, that week or so gap between people getting their finances and so on. Is that kind of the piece you're talking about, but solving it from the perspective of the wage system? That's exactly right. So when you think about underwriting, it's really a game of how can I reduce as much risk as possible by getting as much signal as possible around this consumer's income, right? And and income as in every single possible thing I need to know about how you make money. Are you going to make more money? Are your money consistent? Um, is your money going to fluctuate over time, et cetera, right? And so our role in this ecosystem is to go to the sources where all this data actually sits, like the ADPs, like the you know workdays, the paychecks of this world, and gather all that information. And then importantly, actually spend a lot of time with our you know data science and data engineering teams, structuring, cleaning up, formatting the data in a way that is actually both digestible and accurate, and then providing those to our customers to be able to effectively underwrite and fill in those gaps where they don't really have great visibility and they're kind of having to guess at things and also give them the certainty. So if I am a payday lender, if my job is to charge people who live paycheck to paycheck really high interest rates and take advantage of them, then what you're describing is terrifying to me because my business model of sort of keeping people in this interest trap is essentially gets broken because the real-time nature of the data that you're talking about would basically remove the need to really underwrite. Or even if there is the need to underwrite, you're doing it with something that's much closer to perfect information rather than you know, some sort of absurd interest rate. So what I used to tell my team was, if we're successful, payday lenders should cease to exist. And what I've since kind of changed it to is, if we're successful, the predatory practices that payday lenders currently engage in should cease to exist. And the thing is, like, it's really not even necessarily their fault, right? Like, if you put yourself in the shoes of someone who's trying to create a lending product for, you know, low FICO, quote unquote, you know, risky borrowers, you're working with a very little amount of information to be able to underwrite these folks. And naturally, you know, in order to make the business work, you have to charge high interest rates. What we are able to do is say, well, hold on, there's all these gaps in your understanding of this consumer and how much money they truly make. Let's help you fill in those gaps. And in filling in those gaps, we're actually really excited to, like, we're working with a number of these folks to say, hey, the way that you guys have been doing things is just it's, it's inefficient, right? It's not good for you as a business. And it's also not good for consumers. You're, you're really putting them into really bad situations financially. And so let us help you fill in those gaps with all this data. And now you don't have to charge these, you know, crazy triple digit percentage interest rates. And now you can actually offer them something that is manageable because we've been able to to close that data gap and help you understand everything that is that everything there is to understand about this consumer's actual income profile. That's an amazing impact, right, for the company to create. So I think just pulling that out is really powerful. I want to ask a question about the product and in particular sort of really click into this idea of integration, right? So the company's built all these pipes into payroll providers. How do you actually do that? Because I know what it's like to build aggregation of, you know, bank data or brokerage data, where most of the time you're like screen scraping or using the password or like going through some back door, using some CSV file, you know, and like going company by company, figuring out, you know, can you have their FTP servers and so on. What is the process like to build the connectivity into these different softwares? Because they're all at different levels of being technologically sophisticated. How did you do that? It's clear that you have gone through the woes of aggregation. It sounds like there's some scar tissue from the past. It's a really interesting problem to solve. And the way that we think about it is, I'm a really big believer in ecosystems of aligned incentives, right? And when you think about what 
is happening at its most foundational level. We're connecting what we call the supply side, but effectively, you know, payroll providers, gig platforms, other income sources to the fintechs, the banks and the lenders that need that information. And the consumers are the ones who are granting approval, right? And so if you think about it, there's kind of three stakeholders in this equation. There are the payroll, well, actually four, I would say. There's the payroll providers, there's the employers, there's the our customers, the, the fintechs, and then there's also the consumer. And the question is, how can you create a model where every person in this ecosystem is benefiting from us existing and us building the pipes? And so, as I mentioned earlier, if you go step by step here, right, there is actually not a very complicated way to make this work, which is, where does this data sit? It sits with the employers and it sits with the payroll providers, right? What is the value prop to them to want to open up uh, their APIs and share that information? Well, for the employer, they want to make sure that they're taking care of their employees. If this leads to tangibly better financial outcomes for their employees, and it leads to higher engagement and higher retention of, of their workforce, it's not a hard case to make to them, right? Now you go to the payroll providers and you say, well, if this helps you increase retention and increase potential, you know, like lock in of your customers who are the employers, that's also a win for you, right? And so the first two stages of this, as you start to work downstream, there's, there's already alignment there, right? Then you say, well, you go to the other side of the table to the customers. Obviously, this is helping them build the products they want to build. And so the, the value prop is kind of a no brainer there. And then you look at the consumer and you say, okay, well, you're actually able to access financial products that you wouldn't be able to otherwise if you are actually okay with granting these folks access to your information so that they can approve you for a certain financial product or you know any type of additional feature they want to roll out. So everyone wants this to work. And that's, that's really important to understand those like that incentive structure because it, it's all aligned, right? If you have an ecosystem where there's misaligned incentives, where they're actively working against you because it doesn't serve them to have this exist, then you're in trouble. Right. And so we we made it we, we thought it was really important to just map everything out and make sure that, okay, this is this is ultimately what everyone actually wants. And then it becomes a question of, well, do they have the ability to actually build these systems? And you you hit the nail on the head there, which is a lot of these payroll systems are are legacy players, right? Like their technology is not particularly advanced, nor is it their kind of leading value prop. And so it's it's kind of a it's it's a long journey, I would say, right? But there's certainly folks who are tech savvy and very future forward, and so those are easy conversations to have. Where it's like, great, yeah, we get this. Like we we already have the APIs. Let's connect and let's let's move forward. And then there are others who are you know they just simply don't have the APIs. And in those situations, it's like, well, you know, how can we make this easy for you, right? Do you want us to, you know, co-build it with you? Do you want us to build it for you? Like, we, we don't, we're not trying to, you know, we'll do the heavy lifting here. We just think it's really important that this thing has to exist for everyone's well-being. And so that's that's kind of been the approach where, you know, if they really have it, great, we'll start there. And if we don't, then, you know, we we have a team that's really focused on saying, okay, well, how do we make it really easy for you to actually connect with us? And I think the, the name of the game here is reducing the friction for our partners to join our ecosystem. Plays like this, there's a lot of ecosystem development and partnership development, and it tends to be janky and hard. So props for getting that off the ground. If our audience wants to learn more about you as well as about Pinwheel, where should they go? Definitely check us out at pinwheelapi.com. And then we also have a Twitter account at Pinwheel API. And they can also follow me directly if they want at Curtis, K U R T I S J Lin, L I N, on Twitter as well. And I've actually told the team that, you know, I'm, I want us to be uh, sharing, like we, we push so many features and so many product updates uh, that don't get captured because we're just like trying to move as fast as possible. And so we're actually really making a push to, have that more publicly available so they can see all the updates that we push from a product perspective day in, day out. If they follow us on Twitter. Fantastic. I mean, this is really a company worth following and really interesting trend. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast and sharing the story. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Lex. This was an absolute pleasure and hopefully we get to do it again soon. 
Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the FinTech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things FinTech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.